Good afternoon everyone, my name is Suraj and today we're going to be walking through the midterm from Data 100 in summer 2019. One thing to note is that if you're watching this in the future, there's a good chance that this midterm, um, due to when it was scheduled, likely corresponds to the content from midterm one in your semester. Okay, so this summer 2019 midterm, you'll notice is pretty similar to the midterm one in uh, spring 2019 when there were two midterms, but in the summer there was, there was only one. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into it. So our first question asks us, it gives us two tables and asks us to complete various queries both in Python and in SQL. Okay, so we're given two tables, one called TRFC, which contains a time column, um, a date column, and a speed column, and then a dates table, which maps dates to days of the week. Okay, and as you'll see, um, at various points we'll have to join the dates table with the traffic table, or TRFC. Okay, so in the first part, what we wanna do is calculate the average speed during rush hour. Okay, so um, you can see that in Python, we've set up that we wanna do a dot lock, and remember, in pandas, when we do a dot lock, we ha will have something, comma, something. The thing that goes before the comma is what specifies which rows we want to take from our data frame. What comes after the column is what specifies which columns we want to take. Okay, and we know here all we care about is the speed column because we want the average speed during rush hour. So what we'll have here is just SPD. Okay, and now what we need in terms of rows is we want all the rows where the time contains a yes. Okay, because if the time contains a yes, that means rush hour is equal to yes, so it is rush hour. And so what we can do is say trfc time column dot str dot contains yes. Okay, so what this will do is filter and only keep the rows where the time has rushed equal to yes, so it's rush hour give me the speeds for all of those. So that'll be a series of just a bunch of speed values. And what I wanna do is the, get the mean or the average speed. So I can just do dot mean. And that will do that um, pretty straightforward. Okay, now to do this in SQL, we're selecting the average of something. And really here we want the average speed. So this will just be SPD. From here, the only table that we're looking at is TRFC. So this will be TRFC. Now in this where, this is where we specify that we want only the average of the rows where the time column contains a yes. Okay, so where time, like, and so now here I need to specify um, some way to get only the strings that I want. And so this is sort of like regex, but isn't exactly. And um, this we sort of just need to remember the syntax from lecture four. For this, it's just percent sign yes. Okay, what the percent sign in this like string matching thing in SQL does is it matches any string that ends in a yes. It doesn't matter what comes before it, but it just has to end in a yes. If we wanted to match any string that just had a yes in it at some point, not necessarily at the end, we could put a percent sign at the end. Okay, and then so what this would match is anything that has a yes in it at any point. For our question though, all we care about is that it ends with a yes, right? Because rush is equal to yes, won't be at the end. And so that's it for part A. Okay, now in part B, what we wanna do is create a table T with one row per recording in the traffic table. Each row should contain a day of the week, a speed, an hour of the day is a two character string, and whether the recording occurred during rush hour. Okay, so notice what we'll need to do is go into this time column here and extract the hours and make that one column on its own and extract the no's and yeses and make that one column on its own. We also need the days of the week, so we're gonna have to do a join slash merge with the dates table. Okay, and just to make it a little more explicit, let's take a look at what our table is supposed to look like. We should have a day, speed, hour, and rush. Okay, so what this might look like could be like Thursday, 72, um, 12, and no. 
Okay, so this is the table that we want to build. Okay, so first what we want to do is um, merge the traffic table and dates table. Okay, before we do any of this extraction stuff. So what we want to do, we want to merge traffic with dates. And notice the, sh the thing we want to join on is the DT column in traffic with the date column in dates. So here we specify left on, and we, we will say that that's DT, and right on, so the column from the right table, which is dates, that is the column date. Okay, so now we've done the job of merging the two tables. Now what we need to do is fill in the blank over here with some regex that extracts the hours and whether or not um, the time was a rush hour, okay? And the rest of the code is set up for us. It automatically will put that into an hour column and a rush column, and then T is built at the very end by just extracting the columns we want. Our job here is just to fill in the blank for this regex expression, okay? And here what we need to remember, um, based off of the hint, um, we need to remember how capturing works in regex. If you put parentheses around something, it won't affect whether or not um, your string gets matched, but it will extract the things that are in parentheses. Okay, so what I mean by that is if we know that our string will look something like hour is equal to some number. And here what we want to do is just extract the number and assign it to the HR column. And so how do we match a number? Well, we use backslash D because that corresponds to a digit and we'll have one or more digits. Okay, here we probably, knowing that each um, hour will be somewhere between 0, 0 and 2, 3 or 2, 4, depending on when it's indexed, we probably could just put backslash D, backslash D, and that would match two digits. But just to be a, a little more in line with what the solution has, I'll leave it as backslash D plus. Just remember that backslash D matches a digit, so 0 through 9 comma, what comes after, we have rush, and then equals, we will match the rush equals part, but all we want to do is extract the yes or no. And so for that, we can put backslash w, which matches any alphanumeric character, so a through z, either uppercase or lowercase, and zero through nine, um, with a plus, okay? And we can't like hard code backslash w twice or three times because no and yes have different numbers of characters. So what this does, it will extract just the number of hours in the yes or no, and the code already has it set up for us to put those in the appropriate columns. So it turns out we're done with the Python part. And so now for SQL, what we um, already have is the hour column set up for us. Now what we need to do is casework on filling in the rush column, okay? Because this entire line is as rush, and we're told that the rush column should just be a bunch of yeses and nos. And so what we will do in SQL is take in elements of the time column, and if it ends in a no, we will say the rush value should be no, and if it ends in a yes, we should say the rush value is yes. Okay, so what we can say is case when time is like, and that, so now we're using the same syntax as part A, when it's like percent sign no, then the value of time should be no. Otherwise, it should be yes. Okay, so if, it, if the timeline ends with a no, our value for rush is no. If it, otherwise, it ends in a yes. Um, that means our rush value is yes. And now, we still haven't joined the two tables, right? We did this um, in the beginning for Python, but now at the SQL, we're doing it at the end. What we wanna do is select all of this from the traffic table, but we wanna join it with dates on, again, the DT column from traffic and the date column from dates. So what we can do is since um, there's only one DT column in either of the tables and one date column from either of the tables, we can say DT is equal to date. And that will work. Cool, and so that's um, part B. And now part C, what we wanna do is find the minimum speed in a cluster sample with two clusters. First, we take a simple um, 
random sample of two unique values in day, and then find the minimum speed across all recordings on those days of the week. So basically what we want to do here is select two days of the week. So let's just say Tuesday and Saturday, for example, and then take the minimum speed from all Tuesday and Saturday recordings. Okay, so first we just pick the two days of the week, then take the minimum of all the speeds that are either on Tuesday or Saturday, or whichever two days we end up selecting. Okay, so in Python, the way it's set up, the first line, what we want to do is select the two days that we will um, look at all the readings for. Okay, because we have this np.random.choice line. So what we want to do is select, notice we're selecting without replacement and two things. The list we want to select from is the list of all the days of the week. And so I could sit here and write, you know, Monday, Tuesday, so on and so forth. But I also don't know how they abbreviated Tuesday because I don't believe it's in the dates column that's given. No, it's not. Right? We only have four days there. And so the way um, standard, the way we typically get all unique values in some list or series is just by putting the table name or the list name. So let's see, t a day dot unique. And so that will just give me the seven days of the week. Okay, and notice I'm using t, we can assume that we created it correctly. Okay, um, so I get all the unique days and now so this list just contains the string names of two days of the week. And now what I want to do is extract all the days, um, all the elements from the t table where the day of the week is in days and then take the minimum of all their speeds. So again, I'm doing a dot lock and all I care about is the speed. So in the second, um, like after the comma, I can put just speed because remember here, it goes what I want the rows to be, here is what I want the columns to be, just as in part A. And so now how I extract the rows, what I want is all the rows where the day of the week is in the list of, the list that I just created, days. Right, and so the syntax for that is dot is in. Okay, so what I can write is the day of the week column dot is in my new days list. Okay, there are slightly more complicated ways to do it. You could, you know, create some sort of custom, or what you could do is hard code it saying, T dot days equals to days at zero or T dot days equal to days at one. Uh, but sometimes that gets a little finicky in pandas when you have multiple Boolean conditions in a lock. And also the line that was given to answer the question isn't that long. Um, so the easiest way to answer this is remembering the dot is in method and just applying that. And so now, so far we've extracted all of the speeds from those two days. And what I want is the minimum speed. So I can just say, oops, I can just say dot min. And that's how we do it in Python. And now in SQL, what I want to do is select the minimum speed. And what I want to do in order to extract the two days, I'll have this nested SQL, like I'll have this nested query. And in that nested query, I'll, ex I'll get the two days. And then what I'll say on the outer query is select the min speed from T where the day is one of these two days. So this will evaluate to a list of two days. And once I have that, I'm just selecting the minimum speed from T where the day is one of those two days. Great. And now how do I select two days at random? Well, the key here is recognizing that SQL has an order by random method. Okay, and what that does, shuffles everything up. And so how I get there specifically, what I want to do is I want to select the day column from T, but I want to make it so that I only have unique values, right? And how I do that is just by grouping by day. Okay, and I'm, I'm only um, selecting the day column, so there's nothing to aggregate. Um, so yeah, th there's no reason to have an aggregate here because all I want is that one column. What this will do will just give me the unique values in that column. Order by random, we'll just shuffle it up and limit two because I just want the top two. So that gives me my list of the two days. And now I'm selecting 
on in the outer query, on uh, the minimum speed where the day of the week is one of those two days in our list. And so that wraps up the SQL part um, of 1C, and I think that wraps up question one. Okay, now moving on to problem two, where we'll talk about sampling. One thing to note is that in the summer 2019 semester, the only type of sampling that was covered was simple random sampling. So all of these questions will have to do with simple random sampling. Okay, so we wanna suppose that there are 10 people in a room and one of them is Sam. Okay, so in part A, what's the probability that Sam is not in a simple random sample of one individual? Well, since we're just selecting one person, there's a one-tenth chance that that person is Sam. So that means there's a nine-tenths chance that the person is not Sam. Cool. For part B, what's the probability that Sam is not in a simple random sample of three individuals? There are many ways to arrive at the answer. And so the answer is indeed seven-tenths. Okay, so the probability that he's not in the simple random sample of three individuals, we can express it, so there's no Sam, we can express it as the probability that he's not the first person they select, right? Because remember with simple random sampling, we select without replacement, right? So we can say it's the probability that he's not the first person times the probability that he's not the second, um, sorry, given that he's not the first, and then multiply that lastly by the probability that he's not the third person given that he's not the first or second. Okay, and so you can find that these individual probabilities end up being nine tenths, eight ninths, and seven eighths. Okay, because the denominator drops by one each time because we've already fixed the person. Right, so in this case, we've already fixed someone to be the first person we select, and here we've already fixed someone to be the second person we select, and the numerator is always one less than the denominator because Sam, we have to remove Sam as an option for each of those three choices. Okay, and you notice that we were left with seven tenths. And also do this a slightly different way. We can say that the probability of selecting Sam, or sorry, the probability of not selecting Sam is one minus the probability of selecting Sam. And we can say that the probability of selecting Sam, we can do this using choosing, right? So we're selecting three people without replacement from a group of 10. This can be done in total in 10 choose three different ways. And our numerator is the number of ways we can select three people such that Sam is one of them. Well, so we're using one of our three options on Sam. So now, of the nine remaining people, we need to select two. Okay, there's just one way to fix that we select Sam as one of our people. And then for the other two slots, we have nine possibilities. So we have nine choose two there. My dog is like pretending to dig a hole in the bed. That's okay. And so the probability that we select Sam, we can do some arithmetic here. We have nine factorial over two factorial times seven factorial divided by 10 factorial divided by three factorial, seven factorial. Um, and once you do the arithmetic, these cancel out, and you end up being left with three-tenths. So thus, the probability of no Sam, as we've seen, is seven-tenths. Great. Part C, suppose we take a sample of two individuals by first drawing a simple random sample of size five, and then taking a simple random sample of size two from that sample. Okay, so first we're selecting five from the group of 10, then we're selecting two from the group of five. What's the probability that Sam is not in this sample? Okay, so here we can actually use the same logic in the previous question. Okay, we were selecting three people. What's the probability that Sam is one of them? It's three tenths. So the probability that he's not one of them is seven tenths. Here the same logic applies. We're selecting two people. At the very end, we're randomly selecting two of the people from our ten. The probability that Sam is one of them is two tenths. So the probability that he's not one of them is the complement of that, which is eight tenths or four fifths. But again, we can look at this a little more rigorously. So the probability that we don't select Sam, that can happen either two ways. Either he's just not included in that first sample of five, right? So he's not in that first sample, or he's in the first sample but not in the second, okay? And those are the two ways that we would end up not selecting Sam. So we can say that he's not in the first sample 
Or he's in first, not in second. Okay, and since the first simple random sample um, is of size 5, there's a half chance that he's in it, half chance that he's not. So the probability that he's not in the first sample is a half. The probability that he's in it is a half again. And then now the probability that he's not in the second one, well, since we're selecting two people out of our five, the probability that he is one of those two is two-fifths. So the probability that he's not one of those two is um, three-fifths, okay? And so now we're left with five-tenths plus three-tenths which gives us 8 tenths, which is 4 fifths. Okay, so for both B and C, there are multiple ways we can arrive at our answer, but always, all roads should lead you to the same path. 4 fifths. Great. Now, question 3, changing gears a little. We're talking about regex now. So what we want to do is select all of the options um, or that correspond to strings that match the regular expression above. And we want only the strings um, for which the regular expression matches the entire string and not just some subset of it. Okay, so as a refresher, what some of these symbols mean, if we have a bunch of things in a square bracket, so for example, A, B, C in square brackets, what this matches is um, exactly one thing in the print, in not the parentheses, the square brackets. The vertical bar is like an or, so if, if you have A, or B, that's what that means. The plus means one or more of the previous thing. The S that we have here is a literal. The question mark, so this um, will confuse a lot of people, is not a literal. Okay, so the question mark here does not mean the question mark symbol. What it means is zero or one of the previous character and the exclamation point is a literal. Okay, so you have to remember the question mark is a special character, whereas the exclamation mark is a literal. So we know that our string has to end in an exclamation point. And so right off the bat, we can get rid of option two because it doesn't end in an exclamation point. Okay, we can also get rid of the question, any um, option with the question mark symbol, right? In order to match the question mark symbol, you'd have to escape the fact that the question mark is a special character. So we would need a backslash question mark somewhere here. There are no backslashes in this expression. So at no point are we going to match a question mark. And so that means the fifth option also doesn't make any sense. So we can get rid of that. So now to decide between the remaining three options, we need to do a little bit more work into figuring out what this expression really means. Okay, so notice we have square brackets, G-O, and as we uh, mentioned over here, what this matches is exactly one of G or O. And then we also have an or symbol with B, E, A, or R. Okay, so this matches G or O, or B or E or A or R. So what this larger thing really simplifies down to is just one of G, O, B, E, A, or R. Okay? And with the plus at the end, which is what we have over here, what we're saying is that our string, until the very end, has to comprise of only characters G, O, B, E, A, and R. Okay? Then, at the very end, we may or may not have an S, right? Because an S followed by the question mark Right, the question mark tells us we want to match zero or one of the previous thing. So we may or may not end up with an S, and then we will end with an exclamation point. Okay, but until the very end where there may or may not be an S, and then followed by an exclamation point, everything has to be a G, O, B, E, A, or R. So the first option does indeed satisfy this, right, because everything before the end is one of these six characters, and then we happen to not have an S, which is fine, and then we have an exclamation mark, which is good. The second option, sorry, the uh, third option also satisfies this, right? Because our, all five of the, or all four of the first four characters are in this list, and then we happen to end off with an S, which is okay, 
and then we have an exclamation point. Okay, so this also matches the formula that we want. The fourth option does not work, right? Because we have an S that appears before the very end of a string. And remember, we established that the S is either, if it appears, it's the second last character. Okay, it may or may not happen, but if it happens, it has to be right before the exclamation point and nowhere else. But this fourth option happens to have the S before that last position. So that means it does not work. And the only options that work are options one and three. Okay, now moving on to problem four. We're told that we have some data set of 30,000 basketball games played in the NBA over the last 20 years. And we're told that we have six columns one for the date of each game, one for the, you know, name of the home team and visiting team, and then one's for uh, the score of the home and visiting team, so score and opponent score. And we also have win, which is a column of ones and zeros, one if the home team won, and zero if the home team lost. Okay, and we're told the data types of each column as well. Um, and so what we want to do is shade in one or more of the answers corresponding to um, which are the things we think are true okay so a given the data types of this data set which of the following visualizations are not appropriate okay a histogram of win well we're told that win just consists of a bunch of ones and zeros so if we you know create a histogram of that it'll sort of just have two bars one bar for all of the ones and one bar for all of the zeros and depending on your bins it'll either be you know, just one massive bar for that whole range or two bars, right? So here, that's not really telling us much information. Okay, a histogram, we really want to see the distribution of some sort of continuous or discrete val um, value with a lot of, you know, different values, if that makes sense. Like, for example, an exam score. Um, and creating a histogram of just ones and zeros doesn't really make that much sense. So since we want to select the things that don't make sense, um, that's one of them. A histogram of score, well, no, actually, that does make sense, right? Because that's the sort of thing that we'd want to visualize with a histogram. So that's not an option. A box plot with team on the x-axis and opponent score on the y-axis. Well, so let's take a look at what that would look like. We might have something like Lakers, and then a box plot distribution of their opponent's scores throughout the season, and then maybe, like, I don't know, the Cavs. Their opponents are probably scoring more, so something like that, and so on and so forth. And that looks like an appropriate uh, visualization as well. It might be pretty wide because, you know, there's 30 teams in the league, but it still um, is a valid visualization and it makes a lot of sense. So that's not something we want to select here. And lastly, a two-dimensional kernel density estimate um, with score on the x-axis and opponent score on the y-axis. Okay? And... Coincidentally, that's actually what's given um, in part D, okay? So this over here is exactly a two-dimensional kernel density estimate with score on the X and opponent score on the Y. And yeah, like this is also a valid uh, visualization. We can make sense of this. We can see that the regions um, outlined by darker colors, you know, in the contour plot probably um, correspond, not probably, they do correspond to regions um, that occurred more frequently. Okay, so you can sort of tell from this kernel density estimate in um, part D that this region over here is where most of the games occurred. So most of the games occurred where the um, home team score is between 120 and 140 and the opponent score was between 100 and 120. Okay, so that also is a visualization that makes sense. And so the only correct option um, that we were looking for for part A was just the first one. Part B, which of the following plots will likely suffer from overplotting? So let's look at the first one, a scatter plot with dates on the x-axis and number of games played on that date on the y-axis. So no, that's almost the opposite of overplotting. Um, where Because for each um, date, there's only one number of games that were played on that date. So the plot might look something like, um, I'm just using 1, 2, 3, 4 as a replacement for the date, but our plot would look something like this. Okay. That's not overplotting at all. That's sort of just like a time series um, plot. Okay, so that's not going to suffer from overplotting. A scatter plot with score on the x-axis and opponent score on the y-axis. Yes, so that is an example of something that would suffer from overfitting. 
right? Because for each possible score on the x-axis, we will see um, any number of y. Um, we will see any number of y scores. So, for example, for um, score equals to 90, we will see a whole myriad of opponent scores. Okay. And so it's hard to make meaning of that, right? And same for 91, we'll probably see this as well. Same for 92, so on and so forth. Okay? And so there isn't really much um, information that we can see just by looking at this plot because all the points will be so close to being on top of one another. Okay, so that's an example of overplotting. Okay, so that's one of the correct answers. Um, the third option, a scatter plot with score on the x-axis and win on the y-axis. So this one is also an example of overplotting, but for a slightly different reason. We know that there's only two options for win. It's either one or zero. So this plot will just look something like this. Which it's also difficult to derive any information from just because there will be so many points directly on top of each other, in addition to the fact that this is relatively meaningless, okay? Because there's only two possible y values, and this isn't really something that we would create a scatter plot for. And option D, a dot plot with team on the x-axis and the average of score for each team on the y-axis. A dot plot is sort of just like a fancy um, bar graph, okay? So what a dot plot would look like would be something like the team names on the x-axis, and then some dots where the height of all the dots corresponds to the average score for each team, okay? But since there's only one value for each team, there isn't going to be any overlapping or overplotting, okay? It'll be something that looks like this, and then uh, I'm not going to write the Warriors, but I guess you could write, like, I don't know, the Heat or something, and then, you know, you'd have another one, so on and so forth, okay? There's no overplotting there because there aren't, there isn't a surplus of points on top of each other, and it's easy to get insight from this plot. Cool. Okay, now moving on to part C, we want to uh, determine which of the following plots show all teams that improved in scoring. Okay, so we want some way to see which teams um, had their score value increase over time. So the first option is a line plot with one line for every team with date on the x-axis um, and score on the y-axis. Okay, and this is about um, the simplest way to accomplish this. Okay, so we could have date over here and score over here, and maybe for each team we could have a different color or something. So maybe for one team we could do that. That's not exactly a line plot, but you get the idea. For another team we could do something like this, so on and so forth. Okay, and yes, that would pretty directly give us a line plot, or sorry, that would pretty directly give us a visualization that shows all teams that improved in scoring, which is nice. B, or the second option, um, a line plot with one line for every team with date on the x-axis and opponent score minus score on the y-axis. So this one doesn't work. Okay, and the reason is because what if our score increases over time, but our opponent's score also increases over time? Okay, then the value opponent score minus score um, will stay relatively the same, and it won't really display the fact that our score increased over time. Okay, and so what we want to show on our y-axis is just our score. Okay, if we're dealing with a line plot, that is. And so this option doesn't really um, show what we want it to show. Okay. Third option, one separate line plot for each team with date on the x-axis and score on the y-axis. Yes, that would also work. It would basically be the exact same as the first option, um, but just with one separate plot for each team. It would take up a little more space, but it would accomplish the same goal, so that's fine. And the last option, a bar plot with one bar per team, an average of the latest five games is bar lengths. So this one would not work, okay? And the reason for that is because we need to show multiple data points, okay? So data over time for our score value, just so that we can see that over time it went up or went down. If we just look at the average of the latest five games, that's only one number, and it doesn't tell us how our score has changed over time. Okay, you can't get any information about a trend just by looking at this one average number. You need to see multiple data points over time. So that fourth option doesn't really help us there. 
Okay, so for part C, the correct options are one and three. Now for part D, which of the following plots show that home teams scored more on average than visiting teams? Okay, so it turns out part one does this because um, you can sort of see the region of highest density, which is around here, is where the home team scores between 120 and 140, whereas the away team score is only between 100 and 120. So the range for the um, home team score is much higher than the like, highest density range for the opponent team score. So that this plot does indeed show us that. The second plot also shows us this. Okay, and so here, this is similar to the second option from part C. We're showing date on the x-axis and opponent score minus score on the y-axis. The reason that this is right for part D is because all we want to show is that um, home teams score more on average. And this makes sense um, given this plot because opponent score minus score on average is always negative, which means that the score is greater than the opponent score throughout the entire season. Okay, notice that all these values are negative. That just tells us that score is greater than opponent score for the entire season. So the second option also works. The third option also works, right? Now, instead of just doing a uh, time series plot of opponent score minus score, we're doing a histogram over the whole season. And we notice that if we draw this line where the x-axis is equal to zero, most of our histogram exists to the left of this histogram, okay? Um, to the left of this line, I mean. Um, so what that tells us is that, that the majority of opponent score minus score values were negative, which tells us that in the majority of cases, score is greater than opponent score. Okay, and lastly, the fourth option also tells us this, so it happens to be the case that all four answers are correct. Um, and the fourth option does it relatively... Um, Simply, it has much less information than the previous three plots, but it still tells us that the home team scores more on average than the opponent team, uh, than the opposing team. Okay, so for part D, all four answers are correct. And lastly, for number four, part E, suppose you find a linear relationship when you make a scatter plot with log of score on the x axis and log of opponent score on the y axis. When you fit a linear least squares line on this plot, you find that the slope of the line is two and the intercept is five. Which of the following relationships hold? Okay, so what I want to do here is write out the relationship that is encapsulated by our least squares line. Okay, our y-axis, you know, and our, here we're using the format y is equal to mx plus b. But here, our y is the log of our opponent score, which I'll write as OPP. Our m is two our b is 5, and our x is the log of our score. Okay, so this right here is the least squares line that we fit. And so now what we want to do is go through all four of these options and see which of them is equivalent to this highlighted line. Okay, either in their natural state or after doing some transformation to them. Okay, so let's do that. So the first one, opponent score is equal to 2 times score plus 5. There, there's no logs involved, so let's just take the log of both sides and see what happens. Okay, so here, taking the log of both sides, we would get the log of the opponent's score is the log of 2 times our score plus 5. And you can see that this is not the same as the relationship we have highlighted up here. And there's no way to modify it to be the same due to the properties of log rules, right? If the addition is within the log, there's no way you can simplify it. You can only simplify logs if you have something like log of A plus log of B. That becomes log of AB. But if the addition is within the log, there's no way to simplify that. So the first option is not equivalent. Okay, and the second option is exactly what I get when I take the log of both sides from the first option. So it is also not equivalent. Okay, now for the third and fourth options, I have what looks like um, the log has been removed and there's a lot of E's involved. Okay, so now what I want to do is start with the relationship that I have highlighted up here and exponentiate both sides, so raise both sides to the power of E and see which of these last two options it ends up being equal to. Okay, so let's do exactly that. 
Okay, so I have e to the log of the opponent's score is equal to e to the 2 times the log of our score plus 5. You can hear my dog barking to take him for a walk. Um, now, notice that e to the log of anything, so just e to the log of x, is just equal to x on its own. Right? Because log of x just means the exponent I put on e to get x. So that means this on the left-hand side evaluates just the opponent's score is equal to, now I'll have to use some log properties to do some simplification over here. I can rewrite this as e to the log of my score squared, right, because e to the a times b is equal to e to the a to the exponent b, okay, times e to the 5 over here, right, because e to the a plus b is just e to the a times e to the b, and now I can replace e to the log of my score with just my score. So I'm left with the opponent's score is my score squared times e to the 5. Okay, and we notice that this happens to be the fourth option. So that's the one of these four um, that holds given that we've done this transformation. And that wraps up number four. Okay, now on to the last question in the exam. Um, dealing with PCA interpretation, um, you perform principal component analysis on a data matrix D using the following Python code. And here are some of the expressions that we get after running the code. We get that S is an array of these values. And remember S, um, the entries in S are the singular values. And how we interpret them um, is as the standard deviations of each of the principal components. Okay, so what this means is the standard deviation of the values projected into component 1 is 12, component 2 is 6, onto principal component 3 is 4, and so on and so forth. Okay, and um, in question C, we'll start talking about variance. And remember, variance is just standard deviation squared. Okay, we also have an interpretation of V transpose. Okay, that's what we call V transpose contains a bunch of row vectors and in those vectors we have the coefficients that will use uh, that will comprise our linear combination okay remember principal components are just um, linear combinations of our original features okay so what v transpose square bracket 0 means and right, we have we have that it's 0 0.8 0 minus 0 0.6 0 and 0 what it's telling us is that our first principal component is 0.8 times the first column in our data matrix plus 0 times the second column in our matrix plus negative 0.6 times the third column in our matrix, okay, because the other ones are zeros. So remember, principal components are nothing but linear combinations of our already existing features. Great. So part A, what is the shape of D? Recall that a matrix with 10 rows and 3 columns has shape 10, 3. And so here, um, we'll use two facts. The first fact is that our data matrix D and U have the same number of rows. Okay, I won't get into why this is true right now. This is something we sort of just need to remember from lecture. We're told that U's shape is 40 and 5. That means that U has 40 rows, and thus D also has 40 rows. And so the answer can't be either of the first two. Okay? And so it turns out that the answer is the third option, that, there, um, that the dimension is 40 by 5. And the reason I know that there are five columns in D is because our first principal component vector, V transpose at 0, only has five entries. Right? Remember the interpretation that I wrote, 0 0.8 times the first column, plus 0 times the second column, and so on and so forth. There's only five entries in this principal component vector, which tells us that there are only five columns in D. Okay, part B, we're asked, what is the rank of D? And now this also relies on another fact that we need to remember from lecture. The rank of our matrix is equal to the number of positive singular values of D. Okay, and so we're told that um, the singular values are 12, 6, 4, 2, and 0. There's 5 in total, but only 4 of them are positive. Okay, because 0 is not positive. And so the rank of D is 4. 
excuse me, in part C we're asked, what percentage of D's total variance is kept if PCA is used to reduce the number of dimensions to three? Okay? And so remember, I just mentioned that the entries in S correspond to the standard deviations of each principal component. And so the total variance of our entire data set is just the sum of the squares of the entries in S, right? Because if the entries in S are standard deviations, we square them to get variances. And so the total variance is the sum of squares, okay? And then the variance accounted for by just the first three principal components is the variance accounted for by these numbers here. Okay, and so what I mean by that is that the percentage we're looking for is the variance of the first three components over the variance of the total. The total variance is the sum of the squares of these elements, so 12 squared plus 6 squared plus 4 squared plus 2 squared. The variance accounted for by just the first three principal components is just 12 squared plus 6 squared plus 4 squared. You can do the arithmetic um, on your own, I guess. I kind of just had to memorize it. Um, but we have that this is 196 over 200, which is 98%, which is the fifth option. Okay, which sort of tells you the benefit of using PCA, right? Because we're using only three components, whereas our original data matrix had five columns, and we still keep 98% of the variability in the data, which is nice. Okay, lastly, part D, suppose the last row in X is this row vector, 10, 4, negative 5, 2, and 1. So this is just a data point. It doesn't really matter that it's the last row. That's just some row. So this is just a data point, which is what I'll call it from now on. After projecting this point onto the first principal component, which remember, the coefficients that define the first principal component are what I just highlighted, V transpose first row. What is the location of this point on the principal component axis? Okay, so remember I just stated the way we project um, a data point onto some principal component is by taking the dot product of that data point with the principal component vector. Okay, so essentially what we wanna calculate here is 0.8 times the first element in our data point, plus zero times the second element in our data point, and so on and so forth. Okay, so to be a little more explicit, we're looking for the dot product of 10, four, negative five, two, one, with 0 0.8, zero, minus 0 0.6, zero, zero. Okay, you notice that um, three of the products in our larger dot product end up being zero because we have four times zero, two times zero, and one times zero. So our final result is just 10 times 0 0.8 plus negative five times negative 0 0.6, which ends up being eight plus three, which is 11. So the value of the first principal component for this data point is 11, okay? And if we were to create a scatter plot, uh, just use, uh, using the first two principal components as an example, not that this is in the question, but just um, for, for reference, I guess, there would be another vector, you know, V transposes second row, VT1. We would take the dot product of our data point with that, and that would give us our component, our, our value for principal component two. And so then we could scatter all the principal component one values versus all the principal component two values. Okay, and that's how you do those scatter plots that you've seen in lab and in lecture and so on and so forth. But for the purposes of this question, all we had to do was take the dot product of our data point with the row vector corresponding to the first principal component. Okay, and I think that wraps up the last problem, which means we're done with the exam walkthrough. If you're watching this while you're studying for an exam, good luck, and feel free to post on Piazza or email me personally if you have any questions about this.